meeting is being recorded. In the International Day of Force, we are actually going to convene online events on March 21st and 23rd to raise awareness on the importance of forest land preservation, biodiversity conservation, and wildlife protection. Examining the vitality of reforestation initiatives, urgency of ecosystem restoration, and significance of environmental and climatic programs and plans, we delve into perspectives about the dynamic interactions within the vibrant environment. Civil unrest, conflicts, protests, and war cause volatility in the systems, disruption in communities, and damage in health and well being of the peoples and wildlife. Through discussing wonders of the different types of forest lands, we concentrate on ecotourism, natural habitats protection, and endangered forests. As such, the events provide focused lenses viewed through impactful economics, social, and geopolitical aspects, and contributors to examine forest lands and their relationships with the ecosystems at large. The objective of these uh, two-day webinars are to invite community members to attend so that we can have an inclusive and dynamic conversations about forest lands, that is, to take national and world tours on forest lands while examining their impacts on communities. Indeed, the grass is not always greener on the other side. Anthropogenic contributions and natural phenomena can lead to hazards such as wildfires and forest fires, which then threaten biodiversity, environmental health, and livelihoods of communities. Deforestation, dry weather, infertile soils, and drought can impede the growth of forest lands, contributing to their demise. The events aim to provide space for discussion about disaster preparedness programs, community response and readiness initiatives, and preventive measures that can save lives, maintain well-being and secure vibrancy and vitality of communities, economies, and interactions. So this is the introduction to our webinar today. And for today, we have uh, four speakers in line. The first speaker is Kylie from One Tree Planted. The second speaker is Botitsava Kandarao. And then the third speaker is Rafael Cardenas from PUCE. And the fourth speaker is uh, a staff volunteer from the volunteer program of PUCE, the members, uh, and that is Darian Castro. And uh, Kylie is unable to attend in person today, but she has sent a video um, about killer whales and also the interaction with killer whales and forest lands. And so I will be playing the video. And if you have any questions, please feel free to drop it into chat. I will be sending it to Kylie and hopefully she will be able to call in to answer questions or she can uh, return to us later after the event and we will surely be able to contact you regarding the questions that you have. So I will be playing the video.
Biologists are keeping a close eye on an endangered orca off the waters around the southern Gulf Islands. The most shocking part of this news, though, is that J-35, or Telequa, is still carrying her dead calf. There's no indication as to how it died, but since then the mother has been getting weaker and weaker as it tries to carry its dead offspring above the water. Southern resident whales are already closely monitored because they're endangered. There are only 75 left. We know what we need to do. You know, we've done a tremendous amount of research. We've done a tremendous amount of planning. Um, we need to do the on-ground work. And that's not to say that we don't continue to do research or planning, but we need more investment in on-ground work. And if we do that, we can, we can fix these problems. Um, but it's got to happen at a scale that we haven't as of yet been doing. In the Northwest, we have a unique population of orcas called the Southern Residents. We have a storied past with orcas. Back in like the 30s, people shot at them because they were in competition for salmon. Then in the 60s and 70s, we rounded them up out of the wild, and now we love them. And these whales are known by name by many, many people. Orcas are the icon of the Pacific Northwest. They are a symbol of our region. They are beautiful, wild, intelligent animals. Orcas are the symbol of the Pacific Northwest. They are a reason that people flock here for tourism. They are famous around the world. The southern resident orcas are really an icon of the Northwest. As the apex predator, they rely on the whole system being in good health. And so when orcas start to suffer, it really hits people emotionally. And it's this moment of realization that our overall ecosystem is not healthy. There are three threats to orcas. One is lack of food. There just aren't enough fish anymore. Orcas really love to eat Chinook salmon. These are a species of orca that are not eating marine mammals. They're eating salmon and specifically the Chinook. Way before Europeans came and colonized the area, there were salmon everywhere. So they had no problem finding plenty of food to eat well, right now, Chinook salmon are in decline here in Puget Sound, and that's due to a host of things. We started putting dams in the river and logging in upland forested areas, and it really started to degrade the habitat that salmon rely on. And as those salmon populations started so did orcas, and they are littered death because we've destroyed salmon habitat and we've uh, filled a lot of their salmon with pollution from the cities and, and different infrastructure that we have out here. As our population and region has grown, we've done a lot more paving and a lot more building, and the rain pools on top and it floods off, and all of that runoff, we call storm water, picks up pollution and it travels into the water toxic chemicals collect in the food that the orcas eat and then it gets into their blubber, their fat. Which, for the most part, isn't that big of a deal unless they start suffering, unless they start starving. And when they are starving, they start pulling those fat reserves for nutrients and then all those toxins are going straight into their bloodstream. So orcas are some of the most polluted marine mammals on the whole planet. For orca to be healthy, it's twofold. You need to get their food source back, but you also need to drastically reduce the pollution that's going into their home. And then the third one is um, when there's lots of boats around. Uh, the noise from the propellers and the engines makes it really hard for the orcas to find the fish that are left.
Trees and salmon are very interconnected. Our ecosystem out here is dependent on healthy forests. Trees are fantastic for so many reasons, but especially for orcas. One of the things that caused the decline of salmon is that we got rid of a lot of the trees and forests that protect and support salmon habitat. My name is Rosario Franco. I've been doing restoration for over 20 years. You know, I thought it was just a regular job. It's not. I'm running five crews and we do a lot of education for them, like classes, workshops, because the more you learn, the more you know it's important. You go by nature, nature teach you everything, you know, change the water and, and also clean the water. All along rivers, if you have nice, healthy riparian forests there, that protects the rivers from a lot of nasty runoff. It keeps it nice and cool and shaded, which salmon really like cold water. Um, and it also uh, puts a bunch of large woody debris into the water, basically big branches. The salmon here, oh, they want cold, clean water. The trees, um, everything is very important to the salmon here. Uh, as well as the salmon are important to the trees. When these fish return to their natal streams, spawn, die shortly thereafter, they're providing uh, key nutrients derived from the marine environment that they're bringing back here. So the two coexist together pretty happily given the right conditions. Over the years, we reduced forests, cut them down, converted the land to agriculture or urban areas. So we come in and replant the trees and then um, those help shade the water to cool it down. Um, Water temperature is a limiting factor in the summertime. It gets way too warm for species like the Chinook to survive. One of our biggest issues in this area is our rain. And so when you have more trees on the ground, those trees suck up a lot of that rainwater and reduce the amount of stormwater runoff. We don't get what we think of as a river in terms of that meandering peripheral system without the trees. The salmon use those ripples for spawning. The ripples also create um, subsurface flow. So anytime that the water goes into the sediments, it comes back out again, it's cooled and it reduces the pollutants in the water. So it's actually cleaning the water as it's flowing down the stream. And that provides nice little habitat refuges where both adults and juvenile salmon will hide from predators and also find snacks as they migrate between uh, spawning grounds and the ocean. We need to better support those hatching fry, the, the young salmon. So what we're sort of doing is uh, replacing what would, would have been full of structure and laws, big trees like these that fall in. You know, a lot of stuff is gone. You know, it's been cleaned up. And uh, yeah, and this, this whole little back bay here is selected as a location because it's exactly the kind of a spot that juvenile salmon are drawn to. We can easily create shelter for them on their journey back onto the ocean. And every little bit helps. So yeah, even just this one little uh, loop on the, on the river here does make a difference ultimately. What we do on land matters and it impacts our orcas and it impacts our salmon. We can't wait for additional action to happen tomorrow. It needs to happen today. The more trees we plant, the uh, cleaner, healthier our environment is. It's a very simple action with a tremendous amount of power. So trees are absolutely important to recovering salmon and the more trees that we have, the more salmon we'll have and the more orcas we'll have. It's our impact that has led to this. It's our impact that can lead us out of this. And it's not just any one person, any one agency, but it's all of us. And we have a lot of work ahead, but we can get there. We're not going to let these animals go extinct. It's time to get to work. got some really exciting news at the end of 2018 that there is a new calf out in the water with these orcas. Um, his name is Lucky and uh, he just sort of represents 
a lot of different hopes that people have for this population. It's been really difficult watching these whales for the last three years not able to successfully give birth or raise a calf. So Lucky is, is a very special orca that we're all keeping an eye on and, and holding out hope for. I mean, what would the Pacific Northwest be without orcas and salmon and trees? Um, it's hard to imagine. Foundation for National Parks and Wildlife, working with One Tree Planted, are launching bushfire nurseries around Australia to replace the losses of them. All right, thank you so much. And I see that Kylie has actually joined us. And so if you have any questions regarding this video, uh, please feel free to drop it in the chat. We would be able to answer the questions for you. And so as we have seen, so forests are very important to preserving wildlife and also preserving animals and mammals. And we see how uh, it relates to orcas and how it relates to salmon and also how it relates to um, life underwater. And so uh, trees and forests, they actually are habitats for uh, these uh, wildlife and also uh, life underwater and animals and mammals um, to hide from predators. And at the same time, they also provide shade uh, for these wildlife and it, they also suck up uh, the uh, rainwater so that it prevents the runoff to the rivers. And so as we can see that uh, they can easily create shelter as well. And uh, also the rivers, they actually clean up themselves. And so if we are able to maintain a clean, healthy environment, then we are able to maintain the health and well-being for the rivers and also for the forests. So that these would be beneficial to the many uh, life forms on earth. And so now, yes, so let me just check the chat to see if we have any okay so we don't have any questions right now for Kylie but please feel free to drop it in the chat or uh, let us know afterwards uh, you can actually contact Yongo afterwards uh, when you have any questions regarding the video that you just saw and so now our next speaker is um and I see that you're actually also attending today, so it would be great for you to uh, come on board and please present your presentation. We would love to hear you. But it's over? Is the audio okay? So maybe while we're waiting for Bodhisattva to come back, we can go to the next speaker and then uh, I can check with Bodhisattva about the audio. And so the next speaker we have is uh, Raphael. Oh, Bodhisattva, thank you so much for coming on board. And so please go ahead and take the floor. We would love to hear from you about the presentation that you have today. Good evening, ma'am. I am audible. 
Good evening. Thank you so much for coming. Okay. Good evening to all. My name is Bodhisattva Ganesh Khandera. I am 14 years old. I am studying in ninth class at Kendriya Vidyalaya Yavatmal. I live in a small village, Bosa, near Nirona Forest, district Yavatmal. I am very much thankful to Yungo for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts and mass plantation methods with you. When I was five years old, I came to live in my new house in Bosa. In my childhood, I saw forests fire regularly. My parents used to call the forest authority every time regarding about the fires. I have seen several rural people cutting the trees ruthlessly. I have also seen several rural people losing their lives in the wild animal attacks. These things made me nervous. I asked my mother, how could I stop it? How could we stop it? She told me, we cannot stop the cutting of trees, but we can plant more and more trees to save the forest. In 2013, when I was in the class one, I participated in the science exhibition held in my school. I presented the seed ball project for mass plantation method. My project was selected for district level. Thousands of students, teachers, parents, and other people visited my table. They appreciated it a lot. Also, Teachers from different schools started me to invite and to teach this method to their students. They began to make seed balls. It became a popular plantation method in our region. After that, many institutes started to invite me for a demonstration. I went to schools, colleges, gram panchayats, self-help groups, some summer camps, religious places, social gatherings, government offices, NCC and NSS camps, everywhere to teach the people how to make seed balls. I explained the importance of social forestation to everyone. I requested them to start the mass plantation method. Therefore, innumerable people joined my work. The seed ball method became the seed ball movement. Once I visited a school in a big city. There we could not find soil or cow dung to make the seed ball. Hence, I invented two new, easy and free of cost mass plantation methods. These are the green pouch method and the magic socks method. Excuse me, ma'am. Yes, both of yes. uh, Can I share the screen? Yeah, you can. Jesse? Okay, yes, please. Now, let me see. Um, I'm going to. Are you able to share the screen? One minute, I'm going to okay. And then please try now. Yes, ma'am, it, it is possible. Okay, you're able to share? Okay, great, thank you. Is it visible, ma'am? Yes, it's visible. Thank you so much. Good morning, auntie. Ye kushi na school mein kuch tum kodo. Ye hai koi new teaching joint. Mom, ye tuition hai ekdam new age. Ya kushi ko milta hai. I feel like getting watched. 
The browser you are using is allowing your behavior to be exploited and monitored. Namaskar. My name is Bodhisattva Khandera and my name is Sapsham Is it Would audible, ma'am? Yes, it is audible. You can okay. play now. Hi, we are studying in Kendriya Vidyalaya Yavatmal. Today is 21st June, the longest day in India. So, we have decided to plan 210 days. So, we have decided to plan 210 days. Now, we are making the green pot. This is a cotton cloth. This is soil. Add any organic manure like compost. I am taking two dried jamun seeds and tie the pouch using the thread. And your green pouch is ready. Now we are dispersing the green pouches under the thorny shrubs so that the cattle should not eat the sapling. Come on, Saksham. These are jamun seeds. We are throwing these seeds under the thorny shrubs. We are throwing the seed balls under the thorny bush. There are different types of dried seeds. Mission successful. Uh, Ma'am, please wait. I am going to show you the green pouch. Uh, so these okay. are the awards which I have earned by using these uh, mass plantation methods. This is the green pouch. Is it visible, ma'am? Not yet, because we still see the video that you just played. Now, ma'am? Uh, Bodhi, you can just start playing the video and then skip the ad. Can you try it once? Uh, yes, ma'am. created a business. Now, create videos for your business. Easily and
uh, the video is over, right? Now, ma'am, are the green pouches visible? No. Hey, is it on your local system or on the YouTube? Both is uh, local system, sir. So what you need to do is just close this window, right? And just uh, we can see the YouTube screen or stop screen sharing for some time. Close this window and again start screen sharing. Yeah, that should work. Okay, sir. Thank you for advice. No problem. Ah, are they visible now? Yes. Yes, they are visible. Uh, these are the green pouches. Uh, it looks like this. We have to take a thin cotton cloth like this. Uh, is it visible? A thin cotton cloth so that it gets decomposed easily. Uh, add some little bit cocoa pit or organic manure and any two to three dried seeds of indigenous plants and tie it using a thread. And we have to throw these green pouches and it is a magic socks. We have to throw this uh, green pouch, magic socks and seed balls uh, in the marsh areas of the forest, uh, barren lands, either sides of the road, on the banks of the river. It helps to grow more and more trees. One minute. Thank yeah. you so much, Murasawa. Thank you. And uh, do you have more of the presentations to show us? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm great. Thank you. Me. Okay, yes. Uh, by using this method, methods many of the school children started to apply in their areas using these methods uh, with plant traditional plantation methods we can grow forest faster i think that if you came up with a useful purpose people automatically will follow you i arranged a big seed festival at my home during the summer holidays Many children, students, teachers, parents, officers, green organizations, social workers, and NCC cadets join it. We make thousands of seed balls, green pouches, and magic socks. In the June, we go to nearby forest, valleys, guards, and disperse them in the nature. We sing, shout, and enjoy a lot. We take our tiffins and water pack with us. We enjoy the seed festival as a picnic. My friends are eagerly waiting for it. They enjoy making the seed balls, green pouches and working together. Uh, but during the lockdown period, I was not able to uh, arrange, the green, uh, arrange the seed festivals. My parents are forest lovers, especially my mother. She helps me in arranging such events enthusiastically. We ask people in our area to collect the seeds. Some organizations have established seed banks for our festivals. Some people came to our house and donate the dried seeds. We store them properly. We use all types of native seeds. My mother carries cow dung and my father helps in digging up the soil. We also store water in big barrels. We arrange tea and sweets for all volunteers. My parents are forest officers in our region. Our guardian minister and the major of our city the district collector and countless people have helped me in my work. Once an agricultural authority in, in an agricultural university suggested that if we add some dried grass seeds in the seed balls and the magic socks and green pouch and threw them on barren land near villages, 
it can help to grow good quality of fodder for animals then we started to add dried grass in these things also i read some information about different types of seed balls on google there are uh, they are thrown by helicopters in the valleys and on the uneven lands where human cannot reach i have received several awards for this work i want to teach my new mass plantation methods to people all over the world so that we all can increase the green cover faster and effortlessly i feel sad when i watch the crops and animals damaged due to the climate change whenever the ultimate uh, untimely rainstorms hails or animals attack sorry whenever the untimely hail storm attacks the animals and crops the poor farmers are always affected my hometown yavatmal sees a lot of such farmer suicide happen during this untimely rains animals attack the villages because of deforestation they lose their habitat and food and enter the nearby farms and attack other peoples sometimes the people get killed during the animal attack a few years ago tigress avni was shot dead because she killed 17 people in our area i have recently awarded an international young eco hero award in notable category for my environmental work we must save our earth because if we do not have because we do not have any other option if we work together we can change our planet into a beautiful world learn to earn oxygen for yourself by planting trees plant a tree and get clean air thank you thanks a lot ma'am now i am going to sing a ruksha paath rukshanchi hi ashi keli nas dhus dharitri chi kus nagavali ek ek ruksha japna paris todna sathi ch ghat lagala काळ उगवतो तुझ्यावरी सूड दुष्काळाचा आसूड पाठीवरी गुरे ढोरे सारी हिंडती उन्हात राना मध्ये चारा पाणी नाही कापली सवने मांडीला उच्छाद झाला समोताद सावलीला ताचा घासुनिया जीव देई बाप आता तरी जागा होशी लका आता तरी जागा होशी लका थँक यू Wow, this is so beautiful. Thank you so much for the Sava for the wonderful closing of your presentation. And also I am sure many about are so inspired by you and also the commitment that you have for environmental preservation and forest land preservation and conservation at such an early young age so when i was 14 years old i was in a community and i grew up in an urban area and so i was very much involved in the community but seeing somebody like you who is so close to nature and who can actually be interacting with nature in such a close distance makes me feel like hey maybe sometime i want to actually go visit a forest land or even a neighborhood that's so close to the nature as well 
And so uh, a question that we have uh, from our participants today is, as young people nowadays are facing challenges, what will you do to engage them in your climate action? Would you be able to share some of your insights for us? Uh, I will tell them to use my mass plantation methods uh, the green pouch, magic socks, and the seed balls in their area uh, to increase the forest cover. Thank you so much for your answer. And also, I have uh, one question for you. What challenges do you see young adults and also teenagers are facing when it comes to climate action? Uh, perhaps in your neighborhood, because you are more, uh, you are more, you are more uh, close to the environment that you're in. And also, what suggestions do you have to overcome those challenges, especially for people at such a young age that are still going to school, school children? Uh, one suggestion is that uh, they must use. Uh, steel buckets and mugs, uh, either big, uh, either using the plastic or plastic equipment, uh, and uh, they must carry one plate and glass and one bowl wa while uh, having food during uh, some occasions, and other is to make compost organic compost at their home and save water. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Bhattasava. We are so glad to have you here as we are talking about youth action and also forest land preservation. And also this may very well tie into ecotourism too, because um, in your neighborhood, do you see a lot of tourists that come in and maybe they're helping with the preservation conservation efforts or they're actually coming in to tour. Because I know that a lot of the community communities that are rural and also communities that are agricultural, they are actually the one, um, the one income generating uh, economic approach that the communities are doing is promoting ecotourism. And so this is very important in all kinds of communities, even in the urban area too. So we're always talking about beautification, beautification, cleaning up, cleanup events. So I myself, I am actually hosting a neighborhood cleanup event here in the urban area, but in the areas that you have, and I am, I am sure that in many of the areas, so let, let's say developing, underdeveloped, and also um, uh, you know, rural areas, agricultural areas, when we're trying to promote ecotourism, uh, what ways can you see we can uh, preserve our environment while still maintaining the vibrancy of tourism? And you can take it from the perspective of you. Uh, may I sing one uh, water anthem? I have taught this water anthem in my nearby schools. Save water for the garden, save water for the farmer, save water for the nature, save water for the future. It is must for a thirst in the drought, in desert. When we tired, we feel fresh with a touch of cool water. Sun is burning in the summer, cries earth, water, water. For a flower, for a smile, save water, save water, save water, save water, save water for the garden, save water for the farmer, save water for the nature, save water for the future. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much for sharing the song with us. You just reminded me of me, myself, becoming an international educator and I was um, teaching English to non-English speakers. And the youngest age group that I taught was seven, six to seven years old. And I was teaching them the ABC song. 
So the songs that you were singing today reminded me of how important uh, literacy and music are to helping children development. And whether this is climate education or climate literacy. So it's very nice that you actually have songs in your communities that promote environmental advocacy and also for cli uh, climate champions, championship. And for us, many of us, we talk about our experiences, but for you, you are able to share the message through music. And that is very inspiring. And I wanna thank you for bringing in another medium for letting us know, for raising awareness of the message that you wanna bring in, in terms of climate and environmental advocacy and championship. You are truly a champion. And I thank you very much for coming into this session here. And so now we would actually go to the uh, next speaker, Rafael. So I don't see Rafael on the participation list, but I want to try and uh, try one more time if Rafael is here. And if not, then we can go to the next speaker, which is a, a volunteer, a staff volunteer from the PUCE uh, volunteer program. How about Darian? Is Darian here? Okay, so it seems that both of the speakers are not present uh, present today, and so we would just go ahead and go straight to a discussion. And so we would very much like to have a brief discussion, for example, maybe 10 to 15 minutes, depending on uh, how many questions you have, how many discussion points we have. And Potasava, we would love to actually have you to stay online if you can, uh, so that we can engage more with a youth to youth perspective. Since many of us, we are youth, young adults and school children attending schools. I am a young adult and I am still attending uh, university. I'm getting my certificate in paralegal studies. And so it is never too late or too early to learn or to go to school as long as we are able to learn and as long as we are able to apply the knowledge that we learned into the community work that we do. And it's very interesting that you actually mentioned school. And so the um, discussion that I have is how can schools promote climate literacy and climate education? So I can open this up for any of the participants here who would like to share some of their insights. And this is about school, university, uh, any education system. Pradeep, please go ahead, you raise your hand. Yeah, first of all, uh, congratulations, Yango, for organizing this. It's so inspiring to see young people take this platform and share their stories. I'm sure it's going to go a long way for this youth with these platforms. So I worked with public schools in India, and I also volunteered as a teacher for almost like six, seven months for a grade five children. So I did some environmental related projects with them. So with, I wanted to share my experience, how we can actually make children uh, like, you know, firstly, I believe uh, children's uh, can actually influence communities uh, much stronger than any other group, especially their families. And because most of the environmental issues that we are seeing is what is requires a behavioral change, uh, be it saving water, saving electricity, or taking environmental friendly decisions. So more than government pressure or any advocacy pressure, I think if children can actually influence, uh, children can talk about those, in their families, it can inspire a lot. So I, I just want to quickly share one project uh, uh, that I did uh, with the school uh, about solid waste management. Uh, so basically, uh, I feel you should feel the problem. Anything that you, uh, when you're talking about, you can't talk about penguins or ice melting in polar ice caps to children. You need to talk about the problem that the children are facing in their community, which is related to environment. 
So in the school that I work, so the children are facing a problem because of there is no waste management. So, so children, all of them are facing issues because of smell and like, you know, especially in rainy season, it used to be a, a very uh, difficult for them to even come to school. So once you feel the problem, then I, I talk them, I tell them to identify or like, you know, why are you facing this problem, right? What are the sources from where this problem is coming from? Is it coming from community? Is it coming because there is no other way where people can throw a garbage? So first you need to feel, uh, then you need to imagine how do you want to solve it? Like how does an ideal solution look like, right? If you solve this, uh, then I wanted to, uh, I tell the students to actually list out all the do action item, like feel, imagine, do, like what do you, how do you want to break up this big problem into small, actionable, small things, right? So children can actually do a small uh, circles and actually uh, brainstorm among themselves. Uh, can they go to each of the house and tell them how to actually uh, dispose the waste material segregation? Can they motivate each household? Uh, can they tell them how are they facing because of they throwing the garbage in front of the school, they're unable to come to school, which is impacting education. So children used to go to every household and actually tell them. So if they don't listen, children used to write, uh, give them roses and used to convince them in that way, please don't tell. And if that doesn't happen, children used to stand in front of the garbage bin every day morning holding placards like how Mr. Gandhiji always says, go in a non-violent way. So they just hold placards saying, don't throw garbage. So, so children used to do that. We did it for a month. Then government authorities came and they shifted the garbage bin to a faraway place. And community also listened to actually dispose garbage in a better way. So then I've asked children to share that project to different, different schools. And uh, that uh, became a community movement in a lot of other schools. Children also started understanding environmental projects in a different way, where they take ownership and do it in a small way. So, so what I feel is children, uh, we should make them feel the problem, uh, give them solutions which they can do and make them part of the be make become make them as a change agents when it comes to environment yeah thanks thank you so much Pratip, for sharing your valuable insights and we have heard about uh, the problem and also we have heard about how we can come together as community members and being able to be change makers and how children and youth can actually have more decision making power than we think we have. And as a matter of fact, the United Nations and also some of the many local, regional, national and international communities have encouraged more of the youth participation and how to actively engage youth and young adults and now I would like to extend that uh, scope to including children and school children as well. And so in how we can consult with them, how they can write us uh, recommendations and briefs in the many work that we do, for example, relating to the topic that we have today, forest land preservation. And when we're talking about forest land preservation, we can very well you know, uh, look into some of the plans and initiatives that we have at the local level, community levels. And so uh, can any of the participants share with us about one or two or some of the local initiatives that you have, you have seen in your community that have successfully rejuvenated the forest land or maybe some plans and initiatives that still need a little bit of the improvement in order to reach that state And uh, just to open up the uh, discussion here uh, on the initiatives and plans, I am actually fundraising for a, an international uh, forest land reforestation effort. And the effort is going to raise funds and also to plant trees around the world, including Africa, uh, and also uh, Asia Pacific, and then uh, the Americas. And so when we think about these international initiatives, 
And then when we're thinking about the local communities, how do you think the interaction will be when it comes to uh, ownership, when it comes to accountability, especially land rights and also land uses? So these are just some of the questions that we have to guide you through the discussion. And so we, uh, we actually have a speaker today. Yes, Sayaki. Uh, sorry, am I audible? Hey, yes, audio. Oh, thank All you right. so much for the opportunity. And I'm, uh, I'm willing to answer the questions from you regarding uh, the possibility um, further in this uh, there will be about the land use and regarding the land rights and indigenous peoples and local community. First of all, we have to take a look into the transparency and accountability of the initiative on the ground. What is the background of the um, advocacy program that we are going to do? Uh, and we have to also understand that what happened on the ground is a real fact. Why? Because we 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 need to know uh, the perspective not only from what happened but also from the government side. Like, if we want to do advocacy, it is like not a momentum one, but the advocacy is supposed to be have an impact, like a systemic change or something. Like we we have to make an approach at the institutional level. So the outcome will be stronger because when I am dealing with the situations on the ground, like land use and uh, land grab or what, whatever it is called as, but this is, this is a, real, a real thing that the land rights has an and interlink relations. Whatever we do, we cannot do this at the momentum uh, event. We cannot do this like this is a radical thing. Instead, we have to um, build a collaborations, like what I said previously about the institutional approach. We have to uh, engage with the governments, with the stakeholders, and also the parties involved in these situations and how we could create a win-win solution for this, especially on how we could, um, what is like, make the indigenous peoples or local community who is the, the truth owner of the land, they could win it without any other possible or future confrontations or uh, future problems. That's what I suggest. Thank you. Thank you, Sayaki, for raising the call uh, to take into consideration of indigenous and local lands uh, and land rights uh, when it comes to efforts in, in environmental and climate work. And uh, I have actually definitely read about uh, climate and also environmental work going into Asia, for example, and how the local communities, uh, they are resistant like they, they're, they're being resistant, they're resisting uh, the efforts. Uh, the reason is because the practices that were introduced to them uh, were not ones that were familiar. And so they immediately would think that that would be ben not beneficial to them because they see them as outsiders. They don't see them as collaborators. And so before we can effectively optimize the outcome of the work that we do, especially in terms of climate and environment, we have to first consult, secondly, build that trust and bonding, and thirdly, having able to have a follow-up and follow-through continuously with all 
constituents and stakeholders on the board. So you, we might very well have communities that have elders, that have uh, town hall uh, members that represent them. And uh, this is especially very prominent in agricultural and also in rural areas when they will have like representatives. And even in the urban areas too, we have like re representatives too. We have like district supervisors, we call them supervisors. It might be called differently in other areas like town hall. Uh, we have like city halls and some communities, they call them town halls. And so we do have representatives and it is very important for us to add youth representation onto these boards especially on the board of directorship because we are more and more engaged with the environment and the climate that we do for example Bhattasava uh, he's actually one of the youngest uh, climate activists in India and so if we are able to engage more of the activists uh, champions on the board especially when it turn, comes to uh, decision making we're able to learn about the real life the reality of the experiences, the lived experiences of the residents and constituents that we represent. And so as we are here today speaking about this uh, forest land preservation and also the topic on forest lands, we also touched upon um, many of the social economic aspects and contributions. And I just want to say thank you so much Sayaki for sharing your insights and also for Zava for coming in and also for Kylie and for the two speakers that uh, aren't able to come today. We hope to see them again in the future events that Yonko is hosting. And so this event is actually hosted by uh, Yonko Agriculture and also Nature as well as Indigenous Working Groups. And uh, one last question to just uh, wrap up our conversation today. I would like to tie it back to agriculture. And so I am sure that many of us have, you know, ideas or even uh, or actually coming from agricultural communities. And how do you see the relationship between forest land and agriculture? Like, for example, uh, in terms of food security, in terms of uh, wildlife, and in terms of the environment protection that you see, do you see a conflict when it comes to agricultural production? in environmental preservation, or do you see them going hand in hand as both are able to be maintained at a sustainable manner? So for this, I would like uh, Potasawa, if you are still available, would you like to uh, share some of your insights? So this may very well tie into the work that you do because this is on um, you know, tree planting, uh, agricultural production, And then we also have some of the participants here as well. So please feel free to uh, open your mic and uh, share your insights. I'm just going to maybe add a one or two items, like yeah, points here. <laughs> So uh, it's very interesting for me to actually talk about agricultural production when I don't come from an agricultural community. And a lot of times the, you know, people would uh, like, when I talk to people, especially to, when I talk about the environments that I don't live in and that I don't have a lived experience, I would tell people that I have heard and I have researched and I have looked at and I have attended many conferences and talked to many people that have lived experiences in these communities. And so that's why their lived experiences become my lived experiences. Even though I don't personally engage in the agricultural communities, I am still interested in learning about the agricultural communities. And oh, Sayaki, please go ahead. All right, thank you very much. Uh, regarding the agriculture sector and then forests and then indigenous people, water and human rights. I, I guess that this is an intersectionality that we are talking nowadays, especially in terms of you challenge 
Why? Because uh, most of the indigenous peoples and local peoples in my area, currently, they live in, um, some of them live in um, forests and their agriculture types are based on the forest. So if the forest is disappear, it means that there will be no agricultural land. And what happened after that? It will lose the change for young people to assess to the educations. Why? Because most of the parents here depends their livelihoods from the agriculture sector. And we also store water at the same area called forest. So literally forest provide everything for us. Not only like we pick um, the trees or we pick on uh, the result, but also from the future. This is important to highlight that um, taking care for us means taking care the future of the generations for the economy, for their educations, for the water and sanitations, and also for the human rights that the right to a healthy environment is the right to all human being on earth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sayaki, for the wonderful summary about the interlinkages and also the intersectionality of the systems, the ecosystems, and also the agricultural systems and the systems that we create. And so how we are able to find the balance between people's wildlife and systems is important in how we are able to maintain the sustainability of our everyday workings and functioning. So I see that Botesava said, uh, you don't have much about the agriculture, um, but you would like to bring the farmers out of depression, um, around 450 to 500 programs, including to bring farmers out of depression. Oh, so um, speaking of mental health and also environmental work, uh, there is a subject, a topic called uh, climate anxiety. And so especially to the communities that are uh, vulnerable to natural hazards and also to many of the uh, natural phenomena that happen that might um, continuously plague the communities and being able to disrupt, uh, well, disrupting their health and well-being and not being able to maintain the livelihoods and the vibrancy for the well-being of the peoples that are living in the communities. And we very much would like to continue this topic on the very second day of the International Day of Forests so that we, so that this is going to be a good food for thought for us to take it home and also to think it through and to be able to come back on the second day and engage more. Because as it seems, we are very much well into the systems that we have created. And some of it, we have been exacerbated. Uh, the inequalities, inequities have been in, exacerbated by the global pandemic. And so this would be a great segue for all of us to take home and to think about this question and to come back on the second day and to engage more. And on the second day, it will be a very similar format with panel discussions, uh, specifically from the indigenous working group and from the agricultural working group. And then afterwards, we will have discussions, panels opening up to the participants to collaborate. And uh, my name is Jessica Lee, and I am so honored to be your moderator today. And I just want to thank all of you for coming in today for the first day of the International Day of Forest. And I look forward to seeing you again on the second day. And thank you, Potasava, for coming to speaking to us as a speaker. We take a, very, we take a lot of inspirations from the work that you do and from the songs that you have sung. And we would like to carry, yeah, thank you. And we would like to carry this inspiration with us to the second day and beyond. So we hope that you can join us again on the second day. And I just wanna thank Yongo, especially the agriculture, indigenous and also nature working group for collaborating and making this event happen, um, you know, so successfully run. Even though we are not able to see two of the speakers today, we hope to see them again in the future in future events. So please stay tuned to connect with Yongo in the future.
I thank you all so much. And I thank you, Sayaki, for your contributions today. And also, uh, let me see. So we only have a few people here. So I'm just going to say thank you, Salma Priyal, and also Amoris uh, Jabero. And also, uh, I see one that says S2G Kings. But uh, yeah, but I actually want to just say a personal thank you to all of you for staying on until the last moment. And I just want to thank all of the participants that have uh, offline. I very much much value their contributions as well. Thank you and I wish you all a good day and I'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. bye.